following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. We are back talking ball in the zone with four guys who are absolute mavens. Let me introduce Hal Bach from the Associated Press. Hi, everybody. And George Case the Third. Good from, evening. Uh, Washington Baseball. Um, George Case, your dad personifies the name, um, personifies Washington Baseball. And, uh, uh, I appreciate that, Ralph. Thank you. What a pleasure it's been. Uh, two and a half years now of learning about um, your upbringing and uh, your dad's influence. Um, it's been terrific. And um, David Hubler is here. Hello. Hello. How are you, David? I am uh, fine, thank you. The author of Nats, The Nats and the Grays, and um, uh, one of the things we've never talked about, David, was your um, experiences um, in radio yourself. So um, let's save that for a podcast uh, later on. Down sure. The road. And to lead this group today is... Uh, an absolute encyclopedia of sports. He is um, a maven and uh, proud to have him as a mainstay in the Comfortably Zoned radio network. Mr. Al Blumkin, take over Al. And Thank you, uh, Ralph. Uh, you know, I, I wanted uh, to set me today because I put out, uh, I realized what today was, and the Besides, today is the anniversary of the 120th anniversary of the my favorite movie director, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, two two Yankee greats passed away on this date. Uh, the most prominent the, the two were uh, Mickey Mantle, who passed away on August 13th, 1995, at age 63, and Phil Rizzuto, who passed away at age 89 on uh, August 13th. Um, uh, excuse me, 2007. So I'd like to go around the table and discuss uh, your memories of uh, Mickey Mantle uh, and uh, uh, you know, see how that goes. Who, who, who would like to start? Well, I would like to start a little bit, uh, Alan, <clears throat> only because I had a... Uh, my dad had a personal, you know, relationship as far as Mantle was concerned because my dad was coaching the Expansion Senators, uh, 61 to 63, when you know Mantle and, and Maris had that great uh, home run race there in 61. So I always felt that uh, you know Mickey Mantle was uh, he obviously a five-tool player, but he had such great power. But on the other hand, he was an unbelievable bunter. I think on Facebook uh, yesterday I saw uh, a picture of Mickey uh, drag bunting from the left-hand side. Uh, absolutely perfect. At uh, bat level, he was already one or two steps down the line. And, uh, you know, as great a home run hitter and with such tremendous power that he had, uh, Mickey Mantle had a tremendous ability uh, as a bunter. And then, of course, being a switch hitter, uh, I vividly remember his 565-foot uh, tape measure home run off of uh, Chuck Stobbs of Washington that went over the left field bleachers, hit the clock, and wound up in uh, a yard across the street. And Red Patterson, who was the PR director of the Yankees, he you know made a point of going out and measuring it, and that uh, gave birth to the uh, – to the phrase, the tape measure home run. So, you know, my recollections and my memories of Mickey Mantle are, are terrific because he had such great ability uh, from both sides of the plate as well as his uh, tremendous speed and uh, just, a, you know, great, probably one of the greatest of all ball players uh, in the history of the game uh, with a you know, problem that he had, as uh, Alan, you've mentioned it before, with his legs uh, he hurt himself uh, in that 51 game, uh, 51 year, uh, hit a drain, but he had been plagued with uh, with leg problems for uh, for many many years. And, he had, uh, he, he got, had to be. 
Yeah, he had to be uh, wrapped George. up every every game. I yeah. mean, just a tremendous, uh, you know, burden that he had. But yet, you know, Mickey and Mickey had some obvious shortcomings as far as his, you know, drinking and that kind of thing. But on the other hand, his uh, his innate talent was just incredible. Yeah, he uh, came out of high school with osteomyelitis because he'd been kicked in the you know the what was considered the bad day. Uh, in the high school football game. And uh, when he hurt the other knee in the, uh, the the World Series game at Yankee Stadium, he was playing right field, and the, the Maggio called him off a ball, and he stepped into a drain, uh, which uh, led to problems with uh, both knees. And uh, if he, if I don't know if you guys remember the time, but uh, he failed a number of uh, uh, draft physicals. And they were, you know, these idiots were calling him a communist and everything, and wanted to know why uh, he couldn't, uh, you know, be drafted. And he went through uh, at least four or five uh, military service physicals, and they all rejected him. But the the, the the big thing with me was that it, this kid was 19 years old, and because of his spree training in 1951, he was dubbed as the successor to Joe DiMaggio. Right. As a 19 year old kid uh, coming from uh, Oklahoma, all of a sudden is burdened with this this huge legacy. Right. Well, he was, Alan. And, and I think, uh, you know, when Mickey came up, uh, he was struggling. And I think he almost, uh, from the stories I read, he, he, he told his dad, he said, you know, this game, I just can't play it. And his father, you know, insisted that he hang in there. Uh, he was he was uh, sent back to Kansas City, I believe. Right. He yeah, for a month. Yeah. Think, Missouri. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you know, then then the Yankees, you know, brought him back up, and of course, his, then his career was was legendary. But you know, he had uh, you know uh, some guys. I mean, uh, Willie Mays. Uh, Mays struggled, and and a, as great a player as he was. And and Alan, you talked about the draft. You know, my dad was the same way. He was 4F. He he went up in three or four times a draft board, and, wow. and he got a lot of heat about it because, you know, they said, yeah. well, hell, you know, you can play baseball. Why can't you serve your country? Well, you know, the decision, uh, he, he went to serve just like Mantle, and if the draft board rejects you, you know, you don't have much option. If you still want to play and that's your livelihood, you're going to play baseball. Yeah, the difference, of course, was that uh, with your dad, the war was on uh, for p- part of that time, and he did work in the defense industry. When right. Mantle was was drafted, uh, well, you could say the Korean War was just getting was heating up. But, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> for somebody to call him a communist, I mean, Mickey is a great ball player, but I don't think he knew much about communism. <laughs> well, no, he, David, you're absolutely right. I'm sure that Mickey, the furthest thing from his mind was, yeah. was, was political discussions right. about you yeah. know, communism versus capitalism. So, uh-huh. But, but well, I mean, to, be, to be thrown in there and being called a communist because you're not serving your country, I mean, that, that's just not fair to him. I mean, you know, no. it wasn't his choice, and you're right. David, uh, the Korean War was going on. Uh, sure. You know, I, I've got pictures of Whitey Ford. I mean, Whitey Ford in uniform and, and at the start of his career. And, and the fact that, uh, you know, Ted Williams served twice, uh, but they were physically fit and they were able to do it. And, uh, you know, they served, served, yeah. And, yeah. You know, but, I you think know, if, Mickey, if... And Mickey Mantle would certainly would have, would have served uh, if he could physically, but he just couldn't do it. I'll tell you one thing. I think if he had two good knees the entire time he was playing, he would have bro- could have broken every uh, stolen base record there was because yeah. he was that fast. Oh, he yeah. He was incredible. Yeah, incredible. because he could hit home runs. Right. Yeah. I think the fact that he was so fast uh, led people to say, well, if you could run that fast, how mm-hmm. can you have bad knees? Right. How is that possible? That was yeah. the conflict that, that, that uh, people right. brought up. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, but he was doctor, yeah, but at that point he wasn't really running as fast as he once did, <laughs> which they, these people didn't understand. I yeah. mean, he was fast, yes, but you know, he had lost. Well, and lost also the as a, as a switch hitter, and I mentioned earlier about being a bunner. Uh, I mean, a left-handed bunner with with, with good speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't have to be great speed, but you have an advantage because if you're a good bunner, 
you got a step or two off the plate already uh, when when you're dragging. And I think right. Mickey had something like 180, you know, bunt base hits. So I mean, that was an, an incredible accomplishment for a guy like him. And, and we're talking about with his injuries, who knows how fast he could have been. Right, that was my you know, point. You yeah, mm-hmm. they mentioned earlier Phil Rizzuto also died on this day, and right. Rizzuto was a great bunter. And in, in fact, the Yankees would bring him in to spring training every year to instruct players on how to bunt, proper how to properly bunt, right. uh, which of course is a lost art in modern baseball. But uh, he was a great bunter, uh, and uh, he he had great speed, uh, and that helped him. And and uh, he uh, he utilized it, and and Mantle did the same, and that's you know it's smart baseball. Well, it is. Well, 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 he, said he needed to learn that because you know he was his skills were limited, <clears throat> and uh, in order to be uh, more productive as a hitter, he had to learn how to uh, bunt. He became yeah, well, a great well, well, Phil was you know he was on the small side, and, yeah. and uh, you know obviously he didn't have to have a lot of power, and, and and yet you know he had to be the ability to get on base, which he did, and uh, you know terrific uh, you know infielder, but you know Phil was not going to be in the in the Yankees lineup to to hit home runs. He was going to be in the Yankees lineup to get on base, and whether it be with a bunt, with a single, or whatever it is, that was his job, and uh, you know he he was a tremendous, tremendous talent uh, in his own right. And, you know, I've always maintained, and I have a problem with younger fans, you know, if you said something about, you know, Phil Rizzuto or Joe DiMaggio or whatever, oh, well, Joe DiMaggio was Mr. Coffee and Phil Rizzuto was yeah. the Yankees announcer. You know, I mean, that's that's their frame of reference. You know, they don't and they don't realize the greatness of those two guys uh, as ballplayers. You can uh, throw ball Yogi Berra into that mix. Right, and because, absolutely. Uh, Ron, you're right with Yogi. Yeah. Same thing. Yep. Well, Yo- well, uh, Rizzuto shilled for that uh, home loan company too. Yeah. Household right. finance. Yeah. Yeah, household finance. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, but the Yankees, they had to work in the off season the back then. Something the Yankees did something which was embarrassing with Rizzuto in 1956. He was near the end of his career. He was like 15 years into his career, and. Uh, on Old Timers Day, George Weiss called Rizzuto to the office upstairs, and he said, uh, you know, uh, we're getting Enos Slaughter. We've, we've claimed Enos Slaughter off waivers, and we need to make space on the roster. This is on Old Timers Day. Who do you think we should cut? And Rizzuto said, I, what do I know? And Weiss said, well, we decided we're going to cut you. On Old Timers <laughs> Day, to cut one of the great Yankees of oh, all my time God. was yeah. just I mean, it was outrageous, but Rizzuto wound up in the broadcast booth for 40 years after that. Yeah, so right. it, it, it turned it, out well for him. He but, said the best uh, thing he did. A, yeah, how he said the best thing he did after uh, Weiss told him that he was no longer wanted was go away for a couple of weeks because he was really ready to, you know, to, to make a big public issue of the the whole way this was handled, and he kept his mouth shut and they offered him the. Uh, your job in the booth, and uh, you know, as you just said, it, it lasted forever there. Right. Well, what the I started doing thing. the color, and then he wound up as that main play-by-play. And, and but, of course, people listened to him simply because he was so uh, funny, and, and so, uh, you know, he, he, the game wasn't all that interesting to him sometimes. He'd right. leave in the seventh inning. And he I was going to say, these... David, that's what he used to do, right? He used to leave yeah. to, to beat the traffic to go home. Right. <laughs> He had to go across yeah. the bridge to go home to New Jersey. I tell you what's very funny, and uh, whenever I get to feel low, uh, you know, uh, mentally, I go into YouTube and I put on his induction speech. Wow. Oh. And it's so damn funny that you can watch this a million times. It, it was a total street. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. His, his whole family. His, his whole no, family. I'll have to look. I'll have to you have to look it. at it. It was basically a stream of consciousness. He, he yeah, jumped from one thing to another, and it was hysterical. He was my favorite ball player as a kid, and our dog, who passed away in, in May, was named Phil after Rizzuto. Wow. As far as Mickey Mantle's politics, uh, the only time Mickey Mantle ever appeared for Congress, they were doing 
think it was 1958, they were doing an uh, antitrust hearing, and they called Stengel. And Casey went down there and gave a whole monologue from when he broke into uh, uh, pro baseball in 1910. And, it was, of course, it was, uh, you know, nobody could understand it because it was in Stengelese. So he, he gets off there, and they called Mickey Mantle up there. He said, I agree with Casey. <laughs> yeah, and Mandel was cracking up the whole time yeah. Stengel was speaking, and so were the congressmen. I forget it was the House or Senate committee. I don't remember, but yeah. I mean, they called him more for the you know for the yeah. joke aspect. Uh, although he was a banker in the off season, and he did know something about banking and antitrust, but yeah, he wasn't going to give them the benefit of the doubt and give them a, a straight answer on anything. Well, you, you know, in, in, in uh, talking about Mantle, and, and I always bring this up because I thought it was, you know, just very, very funny, with the, the Phil Lynn's harmonica incident on the bus. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Phil's playing uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb or something in the back of the bus on a harmonica, and uh, Yogi Berry is incensed, and he's in the front. He, he, he told uh, told Lynn's to knock it off. And Linz couldn't hear Yogi, so he says to Mantle, he said, Mickey, what did what did Yogi just say? And then Mickey says, play it louder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the Barrow was the manager the that. Of that day. Yeah, they had Barrow was the manager. Header, so Yogi wasn't in a fun mood at that time. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, they had just coming off a of loser getting swept in a series by, I think, the White Sox. That's but right. one, one of the right. things with Mantle is that he never really uh, – got accepted until he had the big year in 1956 when he won the Triple Crown and Teresa Brewer put out that record I Love Mickey. And they had a right. big year in 1957 in this part of the World Series and then he had, for him, very mediocre years in 58 and 59. 59 especially. They got Roger Maris from uh, Kansas City and the home run, they thought the home run chase in 1961. And people were rooting for Mantle rather than Maris to break the record because they regarded Maris as an outsider. Right. So Mantle All became... What Alan just said is quite true. And Mantle once told me that because he had succeeded DiMaggio in center field, yeah. even though he was a great player, he wasn't very popular with the old Yankee fans. And he once told me the best thing that ever happened to him was the arrival of Maris because Maris was challenging Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth's record. And the fans got on Maris. They didn't want him to break Babe Ruth's record. Because Mantle, Mantle was... suddenly became, Mantle yeah. suddenly became the good guy. And, and uh, you know, they started rooting for him and cheering for him. But until then, he was not the most popular Yankee because of the fact that he was succeeding the Yankee Clipper, Joe DiMaggio. <clears throat> well, in 1963... He crashed into a fence in Baltimore and broke, uh, broke uh, I think it broke uh, his ankle or something. And he came back a couple of months later. They called him out of the dugout, this Yankee Stadium, to pinch hit. And this was the first time in about two months he was playing. He got up there and hit a home run. And uh, the place went crazy. He goes back into the dugout and tells Ford or somebody, you know, because he was drunk. Yeah, yeah, he's he been out losing it the night before. Yeah, and he said to Ford, those people don't know how hard that was. That's right. That's right. He didn't and expect was, to be playing. He didn't expect to be put in. I was present for two, two of his monsters. Uh, the first game I ever went to, uh, in September 1953, he went to the center field bleachers. Uh, he ran right-handed against the title, left-handed Billy Eft. And then in August... Uh, the anniversary was yesterday, August 12, 1954, 64. I'm, no, no, I'm sorry, it was 60. It was 64, yeah, they had just brought up Mel Stalemeyer. He pitched his first game, and Mantle had a shot with a White Sox pitcher named Ray Herbert. That went over, they had that black screen in the bleachers. And he had over the, one over the damn thing. Yeah, they almost they went out of the stadium. Against Pedro Ramos, yeah, he almost hit it out of the stadium. Yeah, that's yeah. the one that hit the facade up at the top, at yeah. the right, yeah. right field. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. More. I, um, my first game since you you brought that up, brought that up. My first game was in 1951, and I can 
distinctly remember sitting with my, with my father. In fact, DiMaggio hit a home run to win the game, uh, nine to eight. But the f- interesting thing about it, I remember that. But of course, Mantle was in right field, and you know, no, nobody mentioned <laughs> that's Mickey Mantle out there. <laughs> you know, so I have no recollection of him being there. I just remember my father saying, "That's where DiMaggio's plays, right there in center field." And sure enough, of course, he did. Uh, but you know. Who knew Mickey Mantle in 1951? <laughs> yeah, well, he, he had a tremendous David, spring training. Right. Yeah, I that, think 51 was uh, was the Maggio. I think he retired. It was his last year. year. That's, that's right. Last year. That's right. Yep. yep. Yeah. And of course, you know, to my father, who, who had seen Ruth play and, and those and Garrick, um, and was a, a lifetime Yankees fan, uh, seeing DiMaggio out there was a, a thrill, um, which he imparted to me. Um, and then, of course, and I even t- I told DiMaggio this story once, but I think I've mentioned this before. He had, you know, I was sitting right next to him in the, in the dugout, and <laughs> he didn't didn't bat an eye. And he heard so many of these stories for his whole, whole his whole life that you know one more story he probably couldn't take. But um, I said to myself, well, I'll be damned if I'm not going to finish this story because I'll never have another chance to talk to this guy again. Well, the thing is that the, you know a lot of the players who were Mantle's teammates, and I think they they had on the the plaque at center field uh, when they did one on Mantle. That's a great teammate because they saw Mantle wrapping his legs every day, mm-hmm. and they were you know they, they said if he can do that, you know we can get out there. I can get out there and play. Well, the yeah, never said- had a reputation as being a great teammate. Um, you know, I think I forget. Well, he was very aloof. Yes, exactly. and And yes. uh, basically, uh, I read a, a story about him uh, with Yogi Berra. It was 1949 or 48. They were playing Washington in a doubleheader down in Griffith Stadium, and it was like 100 degrees. And Berra begged off uh, catching a second game, uh, and uh, they used Charlie Silvera, and they lost the game. And he comes into the Barrett comes into the uh, clubhouse talking, you know, very very animatedly for Yogi, which is a big was a big deal. And DiMaggio stared at him and says, "You're 23 years old. You can't catch both games of a doubleheader." And Barrett never asked out after that. So DiMaggio. I also influence. understand, uh, Alan and Hal and and David. I understand that Mantle and DiMaggio. Uh, didn't have a great love for one another either. Yeah, I'll bet not. I, I've seen pictures of them when I guess Mickey was being honored and all that kind of stuff, and DiMaggio, you know, because he had to do it. But apparently uh, they didn't really get along that well. I mean, Mantle, I guess maybe DiMaggio was a little bit jealous of Mantle's, you know, great popularity. And, and as Alan said, mm-hmm. you know, Joe was a little bit on the aloof side. And Mickey was a good old, uh, you know, he was a good old farm boy from Oklahoma. And uh, with that big smile and uh, very outgoing. And, and Joe was uh, a little bit the other way. He was very reserved and, and uh, really carried himself, uh, you know, always like, uh, you know, the the greatest thing in going and always wanted to be introduced at all-star games as uh, uh, the greatest living ball player. Yeah, and when yeah, they reti- yeah, when they re- on old timers day at Yankee Stadium, he demanded being the last player introduced. He refused right. to come on the field if he was not the last player. So I think the only time he ever did that was, was when uh, they retired Mantle's uh, number at Mickey Mantle Day in June 1969. I couldn't attend that because I was in Kentucky in the Army Reserve summer camp uh, during that, but. Mantle was introduced last because it was his day. And I think the Matt that was the only time the Maggio in his whole retirement was not introduced as the greatest living ball player. Yeah, I remember those goals. You know, one thing I, I one about talk about his aloofness, I think it was Tommy Henrik who roomed with him on the road and he, and he said later on he he never had a meal with DiMaggio on the road. The two of them never went to dinner together. DiMaggio went off by himself. Well, there are two books that came out uh, on the Mantle-DiMaggio uh, uh, relationship. One's called The Stranger in the Bronx, and uh, the other one was DiMaggio and Mick, and that was written by 
a man named Tony Castro, who had a very long personal relationship uh, with Mantle. In fact, he came out with a book uh, a couple of months ago called uh, Mickey Mantle, The Best That Ever Was. And this is basically about Mantle's uh, post-playing career, uh, life after he, after he stopped playing. And uh, he said that Mantle and the Maggio got along on a level. But there was a you know there there was a line that the Maggio always had that you couldn't cross. Yeah, yeah. The the first book said that uh, they didn't get along at all, and when Ralph, I believe, had, had Tony Castro on a couple of times to do podcasts, and uh, when I I was on one of them, and when I referred to the first book, Strangers on in the Bronx, uh, Tony Castro said that was not true. But Mantle uh, was v- lived very, very hard uh, after he retired, and he he drank an awful lot. He also used the f bomb a lot. Uh, Castro quotes Mantle discussing his 1956 season, and every word was the f word uh, in some, on some, uh, every word in every sentence was the f word in some formation. So yeah, well, he spent a lot of time at Tut Shores. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Juicing it himself up. But he was. Well, he, used uh, say, he used to say to me, I heard him say this one time. Uh, he died at 63, and he thought 63 was a pretty good run. He said, "If I if I was going to if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself." Right. <laughs> yeah, because that's one of his most famous quotes. Interestingly enough, his father was 39 when he died because of the coal mines, and he had a whole uh, a family history of. His uncle. Uh, there's a tattoo of his son, two of his sons died uh, at yeah. very young ages. Right, right, they did. And, and yeah. Mickey's uncle, uh, yeah. who was his father's brother, he also died in his like late thirties. But so the grandfather uh, died, you know, fairly young. Uh, who we, you know, used to pitch to him uh, when he, he was learning how to switch hit. A metal for he would never. Uh, was, he did a TV show with, uh, I think, it was Howard Cosell of all people. And Mantle said he didn't expect to live past 40. Right. And I believe, uh, maybe you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that uh, uh, Mickey Mantle's father, I, I think they called him Mutt or something yeah. like that, but I, yeah, think he named, I think he named Mickey, Mickey, uh, out, of his, out of Mutt's great uh, respect for Mickey Cochran. Yeah, that's right. Was, that's what I've heard, too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 Mickey Cochran's real name was Gordon Stanley uh, Cochran, the Gordon Stanley Mantle wouldn't have sounded as good. Oh, with Michael. <laughs> yeah, and, and Bob Shepard, who got a long time great the PA announcer, said that Mickey Mantle was the perfect a little bit of baseball name for him to uh, you know, say over the microphone. Right. Two syllables in each word. Season, at the end of the season, ball players in those days <clears throat> would give away their stuff, batting gloves or whatever they wore and Spikes or what? They give it to the clubhouse boy. They give it to the to the clubhouse manager. So just just give it away, and and suddenly all that stuff became valuable. And Mantle was amazed at the prices that they were getting for his road jersey, for example. And and he couldn't. He got involved in the memorabilia business peripherally. He didn't uh, he didn't participate in terms of selling his stuff. But I, I remember him saying to me. I gave that stuff away. How, how could I have given that away if it was worth so much money? So he, he was amazed at, that, at how that turned out, you know, that development in, his, in, uh, in baseball circles. Well, I have to make you a rookie Alan, year card. And, and, Alan, you know, you guys would know. Uh, I, I think, what is it, M- Mickey Mantle's uh, Bowman rookie card? Is That's the one I have. The Topps rookie card. The Topps is, is the one. Top. It's more, the, but the, it's got to be in perfect condition. Yeah, My Bowman top. card is, 50, is, 50, is his rookie year card. Yeah, but I the, have that. the 52 Topps card, they put out a whole series late, okay, and the uh, Mantle was in that series. He was number 311, his first card in that series. And they dumped a bunch of them because they couldn't get rid of him into the Gowanus Canal. They couldn't sell him because it was too late in the year and kids were in camp or on vacation. 
or whatever. So I didn't buy that. That's why it became uh, so scarce. I have a few of them, but unfortunately, they're all reprints. And well, I have an original. I have an original. Original 52 tops? Ba- Bowman. I have the Bowman, Bowman. card. Yeah. But the top, the, the tops, are the, as right. I said before, anything with his picture on it, whether it's a card or a magazine or whatever, commands a, still, still 24 years after he passes away, still commands a top price uh, of any baseball player uh, since the end of World War II. I have a picture with Mickey. Uh, he was making a promotional uh, appearance, and he posed for a picture with me. And it's uh, it's one of my treasures, you know. It's, sure. Uh, it's in my office, and and I point it out to people who come by here sometimes, and uh, it makes it look like he was my buddy. He was not my buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have my my DiMaggio picture with the two of us together. It was one of those, you, you know, those crackerjack old timers games that yes, they had yes. in the mid '80s. Yeah, and they had him at, at uh, old RFK Stadium. And he's wearing his American League, you know, old timers. <laughs> well, well, David, I, David, was that the game that Appling hit the home run? Yeah, it was absolutely. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, they, uh, 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 he hung around with Billy Martin and Wade Ford, and George Weiss hated Billy Martin because Billy Martin had told Weiss a number of times where he, where he can go and do to himself. So he's always looking for an excuse to get rid of Billy Martin, and then when Richardson was ready to come along, he did. He, he said Martin was a bad influence on Mantle, mm-hmm. and that was the year uh, uh, Mantle won a triple crown, and Ford won 19 games and led the league in the ERA. And uh, uh, Ford said that uh, his biography that he knew how to pick his spots. He said he, he never went out the time before he was scheduled to pitch. But Mickey, just as soon as he was exposed to the nightlife here, and Castro does a very nice job in uh, this book on him, uh, that he just was out every single night. And, uh, you know, it really, really uh, uh, you eventually caught up with him. Also, Casey yeah. said, yeah. I was just going to say, as part of that, he wasn't a very faithful husband either. No. Now, in fact, his uh, father, he found some wom- older woman, uh, and Castro goes very deeply into this was a book that just came out in New York. Uh, the actress, one of the, and uh, uh, his father told him uh, when he was in Kansas City, you have to marry Merlin after the season is over. But they didn't spend that much time together. No. And uh, well, Mantle, time to have four sons, right? Yeah, and Mantle, uh, you know, admitted that uh, you know late in his life that he was not not a particularly good husband or father. Right. Yeah, he did say that. Then one of the also other great stories was that uh, in 1952 when they they won the pennant and they were play, had played the Dodgers in the World Series, and before the first game, Stengel takes Mantle out, telling Mantle about a little. You know, the quirks of uh, Ebbets Field and the outfield. And Mantle says to, to Stengel, means, what do you mean you played here? And Stengel said, but then what do you think I was born 60 years old? <laughs> right. <laughs> Stengel came up in 1912 with the with the Dodgers. Yeah, and he the got, Robins. Weren't they the Robins? Then? Whatever they were at that point. Yeah. And uh, he got four hits in the first game. And he always said, they thought it was another Ty Cobb. It took me less than a week to prove that they were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he, he let a bird out of his cap, too, yeah. at the time. Yeah. <laughs> but if you ever sat in a, uh, I wonder if they ever had a, you know, a, a meeting where Stengel brought in Yogi, Phil Rizzuto, and Jerry Coleman. Yeah, and all of them mangled the uh, language. And that would have been hysterical if they ever had a tape of something like that. Well, they must have understood each other well enough yeah. to win, what, 10 pennants in 12 years. Yeah, Casey, uh, Casey threw, the, threw the Stengelies at the writers. When he had something to say to the ball players, he, you know, his, he was, his grammar and his sentence structure was very on the point. 
about the uh, mantle. Uh, I was up in Cooperstown uh, the week on mantle passed. So uh, I go over to the Hall of Fame. I said, I'd like to see the uh, you know, his induction speech. Guess what? They didn't have any. All they had was audio. They didn't do it. They didn't do videos of the inductions until ESPN came along. And the ESPN, the first one they did was the one that brought in uh, Henry Aaron and Frank Robinson in 1982. So I listened to the his audio, and then I listened to uh, Ford's audio, which is right after, because they went in together. And I guess I listened to Barra. And Yogi got up there. The, you, Yogi took five minutes, and he. He got off. He really wanted, you know, was un- very uncomfortable speaking in public like that. And, the, uh, you know, he made the, he was very, very uh, short and to the point. There's no uh, humor in the, what he was saying up there. But uh, Mantle said, you know, his first line was, uh, I struck out and walked uh, X number of times in my career. And since about a third of my career, I never hit the ball. Between the, the walks and the strikeouts. Pretty good, though. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so he he was, you know, self-deprecating during his speech. Uh, and the Ford was uh, Ford was okay, but Mantle. Uh, uh, also, my brother was such a big Mantle fan that uh, my sister-in-law told me that the only time he bro- he's broken down in there for the years together was when Mantle died. Now I, I believe, and maybe you guys can can uh, you know remember, but I think uh, Bob Costas uh, gave the eulogy yeah. at uh, Mantle's funeral. Uh, very very. He's touching. still walking around with a Mantle card in his wallet. Is that right? Yeah. Oh yeah, he was a big Mantle guy. Right. Uh, well, I hope he doesn't doesn't do it for me when I go because I can't stand Costas. <laughs> Well, a lot of I people can't. Blow you know, a lot of people can't, but he I was doubt. so well known, and and as uh, Hal sure. said, if he, you know, was a great fan of Mantles, that it, you know, given the the eulogy w- was very really appropriate. Well, yeah, that was like Mel Allen at uh, on uh, Lou Gehrig's day, you know. Right. Right. Uh, yep. Yeah. Also, the seventy uh, first anniversary of uh, Babe Ruth's passing coming is coming up in three days. Yeah, that, you're right about that. Uh, and yeah. I think that was what 1948. Yeah, he was and, only 53. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and people look at Babe Ruth. I mean, the last uh, couple of years that he had deteriorated so much oh, uh, yeah. you know, with his health, of cancer. And uh, and you're right. I mean, he was a young man. He was only 53 years old when he mm-hmm. when he died. What's really yeah, ironic? I want, say, that's... I want to say one thing. This has been a very morbid show, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I want to say one thing that. Uh, to me, the two most important baseball players of the 20th century were Babe Ruth and Jackie Robinson, and both of them passed at age 53. Yeah. Because Babe Ruth at card shows would have been something else. But Stengel had a, a, a card show. Yeah, those didn't come around for a good number of years afterwards, you know. Yeah. When <laughs> when all the kids who had all these cards... Uh, left them at home when they went. You well, know, the mothers went threw them all and out. The mothers threw yeah, them out, right? Yeah. The, yeah. Mother, the mothers took good care of the cards. That's for sure. Just for a couple of years, and then they were gone. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend of mine that still has all his fifty twos and fifty ones and all that because his mother didn't throw them out. He has his fifty two tops mantle locked in a safety deposit box. Yeah, I believe it because. The, the real value is in the, per, the perfect condition. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. And the other the other thing was when you bought those cards, the number ones are very hard to find in in good condition because the kids put rubber bands around them, or they put them on the, uh, between the spokes of their bicycles, right, right. and they sounded like a motorcycle. No, you always put uh, one of the things I learned about putting cards in the spokes of my motorcycles. You always put the players you couldn't stand. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, 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 these guys who were me, me, very mediocre to bad, and for some reason, every time you bought a pack, you get one of them. You get one Sam Mealy. I used to get Sam Mealy all the time. But the only you thing I liked... Died, David. 
Oh, I, I Nobody didn't know that. NYU guy. I didn't know that. See, you he learn is, something every was. time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So was Eddie Yost. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yes, he was. And Branca. And of and course, Branca. Al Branca. Yeah. 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 But the only thing I the only thing I liked about the the senators in those days was that they had the pinstripe uniform, so it was almost like the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little Thank kid. you, David. I'll, I'll pass that along to my Washington friends. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I <laughs> maybe that's what got me so involved in the book. <laughs> subliminally. subliminally. Uh, well, no, but that, that's true. I mean, the Yankees pinstripes are legendary, obviously. And, and Washington, you know, my dad was there for a couple of years. They, they had pinstripes. And actually, I've got a photo of my dad in 1943. He and Bob Johnson and... Stan Spence, and they had a pinstripe Washington uniform with a block W on it. So, yeah, right, right. You know, they were they were trying to. I think they were trying to emulate the the Yankees because the Yankees, the pinstripes. I mean, that's what everybody aspired to is is wearing a Yankees pinstripe. Yeah, well, Spence actually did. Senators. Spence was, was Spence played for the Yankees for a couple of years. One, yeah, one of the, uh, the senators, yeah. first in uh, first in war, first in peace. And last in the American League. Yeah, one of the things also is that uh, Roy Sievers, who was, uh, you know, signed at the great for a number of years, and the reason that they moved the uh, left field in Griffith Stadium is uh, Roy Sievers started with the Browns. And he kept the full uniform uh, of the Browns when he was a rookie in 1949 with them. And he, he said at one of the Sabre conventions that the, he got so many offers for that. They couldn't believe, and they turned them all down. Alan, that was for his Browns uniform. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess his his kids inherited that, and they probably still have it. I can't imagine there are too many others around. On no the Brown, yeah, yeah. There are very few Browns around altogether. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, but uh, uh, you know, Mickey Mantle was. Uh, I grew up watching Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays because 1951, I was eight years old, and uh, that was the first year I ever ever followed. And I got into it because not because my my father could care less. Um, I was going to get to games with friends of mine, uh, coming from Queens up to uh, Yankee Stadium uh, when we were 12. You know, during the daytime, we didn't have to feel any. You know, thing was going to happen or anything like that, and we would get a dollar thirty and go up there and uh, uh, see a ball game. So anyway, what got me interested in it was the cards, because I bought the fifty-one moment cards, uh, and uh, you know, I saw Yogi Berra. He says, "Who the heck is this guy?" So I learned, and since I was still living in the, uh, we had just moved to Queens from the Bronx. Yeah, I became a Yankee fan. Uh, let me ask you guys: what what year was the 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 song? Because they were talking about you know Willie Mays and Mickey and and Duke Snyder. Willie, Mickey, and the Duke. Um, that was written by a guy by the name Terry Cashman. It probably came in. We had the Sabre Convention here in 1991, and he did it. So it had to be either 1989 or 1990. What, that he wrote it? Yeah. He got oh, that song goes back a long way. For, for now, Willie Mickey and the Duke? Yeah, oh, yeah. Not I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. I can remember hearing it on the radio before we even had a television. Well, there was no, as I love Mickey. Uh, I know that. Teresa yeah. Brewer, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but Willie Mickey and the Duke, uh, Terry Cashman came in to the convention, sang the song, Got up and left right after he finished. <laughs> he I'm hated serious, baseball. Yeah. He had another engagement. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> and we had wonder, Mel Allen at that a convention. A one-hit wonder. <laughs> and we had Mel Allen at that convention. We had to bring him in a, 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 a car because he didn't drive. And then he t- t- stipulated, because I was involved in helping him you know, run that convention, he stipulated that after he talked, he would not take any questions. Why is From that? the audience, who knows why? How was how old was he about then? 
He was seventy-eight. Wow. Yeah. So I worked with a I worked with a radio producer at, at VOA who worked with Mel Allen on the weekends. Remember Mel used to do the, this week in baseball. Yeah. And I said, hey, you know, do me a favor, give me his autograph. I I always listened to him. I loved the guy. So he did. He got me his autograph, and it was very strange. Um, you know, because he was born Jewish, and I don't know how what it, what he did between that that time and the time he died, but the uh, the autograph had this sort of King James version uh, uh, reference to it, and I thought that was kind of odd. Um, you know, it wasn't just sincerely Mel Allen or something like that. We had a little uh, biblical verse in there. For oh wow! Oh. Yeah, I still have it. Three <laughs> sixteen. What's that? Three sixteen. The, the no, guy used to run around the ballpark. Yeah, with right. The he was behind home plate and he would yeah. hold up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, Mel Allen has uh, quirks, but he was the first announcer that uh, yeah. When I started watching the games on TV, uh, in fact, uh, one of the, this, one of the strange things when I went to, to that game in nineteen fifty three was the first time I ever saw Yankee Stadium in color. Because nobody had color TVs back then. No. Everything was all in black and white. Yeah. It was interesting that the two best announcers in New York in those days were both Southern boys. Yeah. You know, Red Barber and Mel Allen. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, you know and, and, and David, Mel Allen was, was Jewish, right? And he, yeah. yeah, Melvin Allen, Allen Israel from, was From young. Alabama, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. Melvin Allen Israel. Yeah, the bar, Red Barber got canned by uh, the Dodgers because he was a Ricky guy. He was actually a McPhail guy, but, you know, Ricky, uh, you know, he liked Rocky for Ricky. And O'Malley got rid of all of all the uh, Ricky people after he took over. I, I think one of the things that made them so popular was, the sl- you know, in many cases, especially with Red Barber, was the slow cadence. Yeah. That sort of... That sort of evoked the game itself. You know, because a lot of people complain it's too slow, but they don't know what they're talking about. But, I, I mean, here it is, middle of Manhattan, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and things move kind of fast, you know? And then there's Mel Allen, and to a greater extent, Red Barber with his southern southernisms and his slow... I mean, it, it really made listening listening to the game on the radio that much more enjoyable. I yeah, Red Barber didn't uh, uh, like Phil Rizzuto as an announcer because uh, Red didn't uh, think any of these ex ball players were prepared. And uh, the Yankees got rid of Red Barber after 1966 because they were doing a game at the end of the season. The Yankees finished last that year. Mm. Uh, they were playing the White Sox, and they had about 400 fans there. And and Barber told the uh, cameraman to pan the to pan the ballpark, you know, with all these empty seats, and yeah, they, they dismissed him at the end of that season. Well, they got rid of that. They got rid of Mel Allen when well, the Dodgers broke earlier, down. Yeah. Him, uh, when the Dodgers finally beat the Yankees in the World Series. Well, he got he was there till '64. They go Yankee games, and uh, when they it came, to, you know, each team used to supply. One World Series and, uh, announcer back then, and uh, in 1964 they put Rizzuto in instead of Mal Allen. And Mal Allen, uh, you know, was let go after uh, they told Ballantyne or whoever they let him go after uh, uh, 1964, and he went into a disappeared until, uh, as you mentioned earlier, David, this week in baseball started. Right. And he did a really good job with that. I thought yeah. he, that was a, a really fine show. Well, well done. And I think he started in Washington. No, I don't. Maybe I don't know. But uh, yeah, he was a uh, yeah he was uh, like a staple, and then uh, what happened uh, in the, the mid sixties? All the staples were gone. Yeah. Uh, until uh, you know, until they. Uh, uh, Steinbrenner came in and you know built the team back up. Well, you know, you get to you get to a certain point and it's the years sort of become compressed. Yeah. And when I hear that, when I hear what's his name, the uh, Yankee announcer now who just came back, uh, John Sterling. John Sterling, 
and they were, you know, calling him the voice of the Yankees 40 years. And I think, he couldn't be there 40 years. I mean, it's impossible. You know, uh, Mel Allen is still there somewhere. <laughs> he's a, he's a, uh, John Snowing is 81. Yeah, I know. I heard and that. Susan Wolmer is turning 70 this year. So it's amazing that they're still still out there announcing these games. But uh, now I, we can get the whole uh, you know, discussion of announcers, and uh, you know everybody will tell who they can't stand. <laughs> because uh, yeah, my my standard with announcers is that the, is that uh, the less they annoy me, the better I like them. Yeah, well, sure. Well, that's the whole thing about uh, Ben Scully and uh, and uh, yeah. you know Red Barber. You know they they paint word word pictures, and and that's the gift. You know you don't have to be up there pontificating, but you describe what's going on, and and you know you want to listen to those guys. They're they're such great announcers, and and Ben Scully, I guess, just retired, didn't he? After so yeah, many, after, you know, yeah, after what fifty years, years ago, yeah. or sixty, whatever it is, yeah, yeah. So they they were great announcers, and. Uh, you know, I think that uh, Red Barber, uh, matter of fact, I, I've got a, you talked about Mel Allen, I've got a tape, a radio tape, uh, the 43 All-Star game, and uh, Mel Allen and Red Barber were, were in the broadcast booth together. Wow. So, wow. I mean, it's a, they go back a long, long way. And uh, when my dad uh, was honored by the city of Trenton in uh, 1975, I had a chance to meet Mel Allen because he came down, he was the keynote speaker. And I've got a picture of uh, of Mel and my dad signing uh, this uh, large uh, uh, port we have. And, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of actually meeting Mel Allen. And he said to the audience that night, he said, I could have been a lot of places, but I wanted to be here tonight and try to honor George Case. So you wow. know, I, I have a very fond uh, memory of, of Mel Allen, as a, both as an announcer and from a personal point of view. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure he started in Washington. It could have been, uh, you know, I don't remember. I, I know that, that uh, you know, Arch uh, McDonald had, had been in Washington, went to New York, and yeah. then came back to Washington. And it could have been uh, during an early time frame, Alan, that, that Mel Allen did, you know, d- uh, did go and, and do some broadcasting in, in Washington. I mean, you know, Bob Wolf was there for a long time. And, yes. And Arch McDonald yeah. and, and those greats. But uh, it could have been that, that Mel did get a start. And uh, you know he was the the, the Yankees used to uh, after they fired him they used to try him uh, into for old timers days they used to bring him in every so often. Right. But he was the voice of the Yankees. Uh, you know when I started following it and it, he just was uh, you know I know he uh, when he was doing double headers and Valentine Ale. Yeah, ba- was Valentine the last. I can yep. always remember those home runs, right? Yeah, and the beer, beer was the first game, and that was the, the second game of the double headers. And he uh, sometimes during the second game of the double headers was a little, uh, you know, to the wind. Right. Well, they had they, their sponsor also was White Owl Cigars. Yeah, White Owl Wallop. Yeah. But uh, or a three ring blast with Valentine yeah. beer. Right. Yeah. And he was uh so you know, <laughs> How about that? Yes, yeah. everybody even everybody. And uh it, yeah, he he was just part of it the whole uh, you yeah, the whole uh, setup when uh, when I started following. Well, yeah, he he spanned the greatest era in yeah. Yankee baseball. You know, from Ruth and Gehrig to DiMaggio and Mantle. I mean, uh even Sterling hasn't had that kind of good luck. He's had several really good years with the Yankees and a couple of, you know, three three World Series in a row, things like that. But to go from Babe Ruth and, and Lou Gehrig to, you know, Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio. Well, you know, you're talking about you're talking about icons of the game. Right. Uh, there were, today, I mean, we have some great players. Don't kid me. Don't Oh, kid no, me. you're right. There are Absolutely. Some great but you can't mention them in the same sentence with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and, and Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio. You just can't. Those guys really were icons of the game. DiMaggio hit in 56 consecutive games. Nobody's ever going to do that. 
Uh, and then 17 uh, again afterwards. 14 home runs. Yeah, well, he was a lot better before the war than he was afterwards. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and, well, oh, and uh, what Dimaggio had the, uh, the the record for uh, base hits in, in the uh, the Pacific Coast League. Yeah. Before he came up, he hit like what? Three ninety eight. Yeah, three ninety eight. No, I'm talking about his batting yeah. average. I'm talking about yeah. how many he, he had uh, consecutive games with a base hit. Uh, it was more Let's than say it's sixty one. I think it was. 61. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, uh, but th- they used to play very uh, elongated seasons. They played the. Uh, 170, a couple of years, they even played 200 game seasons because the uh, weather was so good out there. Yeah, well, but that didn't mean it. that didn't affect kidding somebody. No. Well, what happened with DiMaggio was he hurt his knee getting out of a cab, and the Yankees the only ones willing to take a chance on him. Well, they picked the best of the three, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, Dominic was a terrific ball player in his own right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, he was. Mm-hmm. Hey guys, this was this was great. You know, we could talk yeah. all this stuff. And, and Forever, I know, yeah. Alan, uh, Hal, you mentioned about being more, but I think we we ended on an upbeat uh, discussion. Yeah, we did. With, with... We managed <laughs> so... to get out of the morbid part. <laughs> yeah, there you well, go. Well, knowing Alan, I thought he was going to choose a topic like the twenty three Phillies. What are, you know? What no, no. <laughs> I was thinking of uh, doing the whole Yankee dynasty from forty seven through forty nine through sixty four, but that would take forever. So I was you posting, were going to name all the players on all the Yeah, well, I was, well, well, <laughs> when I was posting uh, uh, about Mantle and Rizzuto today, uh, I figured this would be a good topic. Yeah, uh, it was good. I didn't very, realize very it Very good topic, Alan. It was. Hey, Thank excellent. you. I got, I got to run, guys. So always okay. good to talk to you. All all right. Right. Take, Take care. See you next week. Okay. Okay. Nice Thank topic, you. Alan. Everybody. Okay. Talk to you. Right. Bye, Hal. Bye, David. <laughs>